Welcome to the First Customers Podcast. We're here with Scott Stauffer today, the co-founder of Market Brew, a, a, an SEO testing platform used by Fortune 100 companies. Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks. Good to be here. Let's start off by learning a little bit about your childhood. Where'd you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Northeast Ohio. Uh, right. And so uh, grew up with a sort of a blue collar family. Uh, I would say uh, just outside the, the city of Akron. Um, oh, wow. The My wife's home, from Akron. Home, home of LeBron James. No so, uh, yeah. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, went to... Went to school in Northeast Ohio and then uh, went to college uh, not too far away in Pittsburgh uh, at Carnegie Mellon University. So that's sort of okay. my, the beginning of my life there. Yeah. Did you sell anything as a kid, like lemonade stands, door-to-door fundraiser stuff, anything like that? Um, I oddly was not really into uh, – I was not exposed to to too many uh, business-related activities. Um, my father later on, he, he uh, uh, was in the tool and die industry. And okay. his whole life, and and later on, uh, he started his own tool and die company called Polymer Mold Engineering. Uh, and so I was able to sort of see uh, the struggles and the challenges of of uh, somebody trying to you know start their own business that way. So, uh, but not, nothing early on. I was never sort of a very business oriented person. Uh, I was more of a technical person. I played a lot. I did a lot of gaming. Um, so yeah, cool. All right, and what did you study when you went to university? Uh, I studied uh, computer engineering and electrical engineering. I actually got a, um, a bachelor's and master's degree in both. Whoa! Uh, so I I uh, I was uh, coming out of high school, and I was very good at uh, math and science. And I kind of looked at the yes, U.S. So. News and World Report list of the top uh, the top fields to uh, make money. I was always very interested in making a lot of money. And, uh, so I guess that, that, uh, that's one drive, uh, that I have shared with business owners and, yeah. uh, engineering was electrical engineering was at the top of that list. And so then I said, okay, which, uh, what are the top three, uh, universities in the world that do that? It was MIT, Stanford, and Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon was two hours uh, drive from from Northeast Ohio where I grew up, so that was uh, sort of what what I chose. Um, wow. So yeah. <laughs> so you were seriously doing some math there. Yeah, we did, uh, we did. We did like signals and systems. I was designing circuit boards. I was also designing uh, counterintelligence uh, technology for satellites. Um, also, uh, you know, ASIC uh, design for. Uh, uh, like Intel chips and stuff. I went out and almost oh, wow. uh, worked for Intel out of college. Um, Any Bitcoin miners? Not at that time, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I was doing a lot of motherboards. There was a, I ended up doing an internship at IBM for two years, uh, my junior and senior year down in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, and uh, this was uh, uh, a lot of signals and systems type uh, systems, network adapters, net network adapter cards, basically for commercial operations. Um, the funny thing is, is that uh, uh, right out of college, I'm, I'm down there at IBM and I get a, I get a phone call from a, a, a buddy of mine that uh, was in the master's program at Carnegie Mellon by the name of Jeff Hendry. And he wanted to start up a, a company. He had been working at Singular Wireless and uh, he uh, he wanted to start a new company that uh, was going to take advantage of all the GPS location information that uh, cell phones were about to have. And he wanted to sort of build a location-based services platform that uh, people could mm -hmm. build applications on top of. And he wanted to write it in Java. We had been exposed to sort of the, one of the first classes in Java in 1996 at Carnegie Mellon. It was one of the, you know, the sort of the modern version of C++. And so we had uh, uh, shared a lot of the uh, uh, background with all of that. And uh, he, uh, so I immediately uh, said yes, because it was just sort of a, a awesome timing. It's going to be Palo Alto, California, and, you know, right in the heart of Silicon Valley. It was sort of a dream uh, that I always had. And, um, and so, yeah, then I immediately went into computer science. Uh, the funny thing is I, I had already, been programming since I was six years old. So in six, Ooh. when I was six, uh, I got a uh, my first computer, the Commodore sixty four, 
And, uh, and this was, uh, one of the life changing moments, uh, that kind of, uh, moved me towards, uh, uh, t- t- you know, that kind of direction in life. And, uh, my, my mom would go to stores and buy me books of basic programs, programs that were, you know, they were lit. The basic uh, code was in the, the book. And then you would sort of, you'd have to transpose and type that into the, uh, Commodore 64 and run it. And then you could play these games. And of course there was no hard drive or floppy drive right away that could save any of this stuff. So, uh, you know, the power would go out after, you know, writing code for three hours and I'd have to start all over. <laughs> oh and so God. you do that over and over again. And you just, I just, I just started learning how to code. So I, I, you know, I understood sort of without even thinking about it after a while. What and, was the, what was the reason yeah. for getting the Commodore 64 in the first place? Were you interested in coding specifically, or is it just your parents? You know, like, give the boy technology. I don't think, I, I'm not sure if it was something I was asking for at the time. Um, I don't remember that I was, um, and it was uh, sort of a, a gift. I think it was a gift from my my grandma, uh, grandma and grandpa. And hmm. so, uh, yeah, I, I just I, I don't think I requested it. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but um, now yeah, the Commodore so. 64 was that like a gaming specific thing, or was it just a general early computer? Or it was kind of both. Okay. Uh, you know, at the time, like Atari had been out, um, and gotcha. some of the uh, I, there, there had been a few predecessors to this, uh, but Commodore 64 was sort of the first mainstream. It was sort of like, if you want to think about it, it as like the Apple version of it. Uh, it was just okay. very marketed very well and it was packaged very well. Um, so yeah, that's crazy. That's a wild gift from, from grandma to a six year old. <laughs> so I, they, I, know, I was a weird kid. Right? So I, loved, <laughs> I loved it. I, I, I gobbled it up and. That's and amazing. then obviously I went into, uh, you know, and I, as games came out for the Commodore 64, I'd play, a, you know, uh, Dr. J and Larry Bird and uh, <laughs> uh, First Strike, First Eagle Strike or Strike Eagle, something like that. Uh, yeah. That really got me into flying, which I would later become a pilot in, later in life. Oh, wow. And so uh, a lot of things th- uh, that I learned on the, the Commodore 64 that kind of uh, parlayed into later things and um, got into gaming, uh, on the, on the Nintendo, the original Nintendo, um, yeah. du- you know, duck hunt and, uh, uh, Mike Tyson's punch out and all that stuff. It used yeah. to be like, I grew up on that metal gear, all the, all the kinds of yeah. cool games. So yeah, I can handle those. The ones you don't have to code yourself. <laughs> that's, that's where I ended in. Okay. And so you started learning programming on your own six years old. And then, I mean, when did you start like the business side of programming? Did you do any like freelance or anything through high school or anything like that? I helped my dad uh, a couple times uh, create like these automatic installers for uh, uh, for his business. Uh, he did a lot of uh, you know AutoCAD and and other okay. things that required lots of drivers and setups for for different computers. And, you know, back, this is back when, you know, AutoCAD would come in, like you'd get a hundred floppy disks <laughs> you'd have to load them all in. And, and, uh, yeah. so I, I would write like, uh, different drivers in DOS to like facilitate MS DOS, uh, to facilitate like uh, the, the help of, of installation scripts and stuff. So it was just basically just for my father. Um, I didn't really get into the business side of coding until my, that first startup out of uh, college, uh, a company called Gravitate. And this is my friend, Jeff, Jeffrey Hendry's company. I was one of the first uh, employees there and, um, and, and just kind of learned how the Silicon Valley worked. That was sort of my uh, introduction. Uh, it, the, the timing was really interesting because at that time, uh, uh, two men by the name of Larry uh, Page and Sergey Brin were right down the street with a team that was just uh, uh, starting to build their company. And we would often see them and, you know, I'm sure we were eating next to them all the time. Uh, that's that crazy. It was just kind of the same uh, same place, same location. Our offices were literally right down the, the street from Stanford. Um, and Those are the Google founders for yeah. who doesn't know who those two people are. Yeah, they founded Google. Uh, it, you know, so at the time the search engine was Alta Vista. I don't know if you remember that, but, yeah. um, 
Uh, at the time, I, I really wasn't paying too much of atten- uh, attention to it. Uh, we were just hardcore co- coding. Uh, uh, we had raised, uh, I think around seven or $8 million for the company. Um, and did a lot of business with, uh, uh, some Japanese telecommunications companies. Um, th- then the dot com bu- bubble burst. And so mm-hmm. I got to go through that as well as sort of the, the lean years and figuring out like, okay, like this is, uh, it's not just about like raising money with no business plan. You had to actually have a real, right. real business plan to make money. Uh, and that what was really, that first business. Uh, what was the, like the actual service or product behind that gravitate? Business? Yeah, it was a location based services company. So essentially okay. we uh, had an API that people could program, uh, you know, the, the telecommunications companies could, could effectively use to, uh, develop location based apps on their phones. Gotcha. This is back in uh, early 2000, 2001. Okay, that's what you were saying about the GPS related. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah. and, and if you're, uh, if you remember, um, you know, with, uh, everything that happened, GPS really kind of didn't roll out as quickly as possible. And so we were doing a lot of things in the meantime, I have a patent called G voice, which is essentially oh. the, uh, application that people could call in with their phone and answer a few questions about essentially where they were and it would detect their voice. It would do a, a, a voice detection and translate that into, uh, 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 actual text uh, location, and then translate that, uh, into latitude longitude. And, uh, they would Whoa. hang up and then their phone would now know where they were and all the applications could work based off of those, uh, latitude longitude coordinates. I so took you the entire the census. Yeah. I took the t- entire set U S census tiger database. Uh, and I wrote, uh, in Perl, a, a, re- a regular expression, uh, scripts to parse out the entire tiger database and, uh, and basically uh, put a, a hierarchy of, of databases that could go and uh, look up latitudes and longitudes based off of the location. So, so anyway, so yeah, yeah. So there were some uh, things that we kind of like hurdles that were not in our control that, you know, where the GPS uh, didn't really uh, roll out as quickly as, as uh, we were uh, thinking, obviously then nine 11 uh, was, uh, had occurred and uh, the, the whole rollout of, everything in the dot-com bubble bursting. It's just kind of slowed everything down. Uh, you know, the, the iPhone really wouldn't come out until, you know, like 2004, I think. Uh, so, uh, we we're just a little, a little bit early on that, um, yeah. that specific, uh, product, but, but yeah. the, the GPS technology itself, I guess, wasn't it like Clinton in the nineties that like signed something that made that available for the public? Correct. To, to yeah. Use? So it was available. It's, just wasn't the phones, the, the, the phone handsets were, were not integrating, uh, the GPS as quickly as, as we had planned essentially. So, yeah. Wow. So you're just too early. Hmm. Yeah, we were too early. (laughs) Did you survive the dot-com crash? I did. Um, yeah. So, I mean, (laughs) I mean, I mean, you know, the, the, uh, you know, that wasn't, that was not my company, uh, you know, that I started. Uh, so obviously, uh, you know, when I say I did, I, I, the company got sold off to a company called map blast. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, that, that basically, I think it was map blast. Uh, there was map quest and a bunch of other ones. Uh, I, I, I then went, uh, and did a couple other startups in San Francisco. Uh, one was like a API services middleware and all of this was being done in Java. So I, I really kind of fell back in love with computer science and, and the, the programming side of things, uh, you know, we're, we're all getting paid six figures and having like just absolutely, you know, an incredible career off of it. And so I just kind of stuck with it and, um, you know, here I am like early twenties, uh, you know, having hundreds of thousands of dollars (laughs) paid for me for doing that, something that I was doing since I was six years old. Uh, but so you like play to you in a way, like, being able to just code a program it's is that natural yeah yeah i mean it's not early? it's not very hard for me it's something that i'm I, i've always just sort of and maybe put, because i started so early in life it's just been so right. natural kind of like typing or something um wow. but yeah so so uh i did that for a little while and then uh we we actually moved uh to florida and uh uh in the process of doing that, uh, just sort of a change of scenery. Uh, we wanted to, uh, sort of get out of the, the Silicon Valley, me and, uh, my fiance, which would be eventually my wife. And, uh, we, we met, 
a couple that had figured out how to hack Google essentially. And they, hmm. they were able to rank all of their, uh, their, 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 uh, travel site, uh, above all of the, the travel and hotel sites on Google for, uh, wow. for, for Key West, for the, the Key West region. And I just thought this was fascinating. It was an amazing computer science problem. Uh, and could you put us in the, the timeline? What year roughly is this? Cause SEO has such big eras of change and everything. So this would be somewhere around 2004. Okay. Uh, 2005 era. Uh, and so I come along and say, well, Hey, you know, uh, why not just, why limit this to Key West? We, I could replicate everything that you're doing here, uh, with every other city in the world. And, uh, so we, we did that. We actually started a company, the original, uh, you know, my original introduction into, uh, to SEO, uh, and, in the meantime, right before that, I think I was I was building uh, automated systems for the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. And I had tried to start a company called 007 Trader uh, hmm. uh, or 008 Trader <laughs> and uh, basically uh, selling stock signals and stuff based off of, uh, you know, uh, these automated trading scripts that I had uh, regression tested. And so I had just started, I kind of, I was, it was, I was trying to figure out a way to use my programming skills to build a company because I knew sort of where I wanted to go in my career. I, I wanted to start some sort of company based off of that. Um, but I, I was really struggling figuring out like what that, what that business model would look like or wh what models that I could do that would use my, my uh, abilities the best. Uh, and then all, along, all of a sudden this, this came along and it just kind of fell in my lap. I was just like, wow. This is actually very interesting to me. Uh, I don't know too many people in the SEO space that have the the pedigree that I had. I don't think I, yeah. I probably was one of the only ones. Uh, it, it, maybe there's probably you know a room full of, of other guys or, or girls that were you know in that at that time uh, do, doing being able to do like enterprise level you know software. Um, and so it, for for about a year we played this cat and mouse game. I, I got to know what what you know. Uh, you know, the, the Google algorithm updates were essentially, uh, and, uh, Google ended up rolling out a thing called the supplemental index to counteract all of my algorithms. So basically mm -hmm. the, the supplemental index was a way to counteract, uh, a programmatic SEO is what, what, what we would call it today, uh, where we would be okay. able to take, uh, uh, you know, a list of all the cities in the world. And I could build a site that all had all the content landing pages for every city, for every uh, specific keyword that we were trying to target. You would give it a list of, of keywords. We called this the Shelby system. It was codenamed mm -hmm. Shelby uh, based off of the car. And this uh, list, you could give a list of all these keywords and uh, it would then go and generate all this content and immediately just took over all of the number one spots uh, on every search li uh, listing, and uh, and then you know, it, Google would catch that they would they would uh, introduce some some change or whatever, and then it I would try to manipulate that, and it was just a it was it was truly like a, the black hat approach to SEO. I didn't really know what black hat meant at that time or white hat. Everyone seemed to be doing it, and I was just like, okay, this is the thing you do. I don't know. Um, gotcha. And so yeah, so I just uh, I really uh, I had known about Google. I actually. We would go to uh, in, in San Francisco. We'd go to like movies and and see the Google ads uh, before the movie. And they were <laughs> hiring and they were saying, "Hey, if you know uh, if you know Python or uh, uh, C, you know, uh, we want to have you guys." And I was doing Java, and I was like, "Yeah, I, you know, like I want to work for them, but like I don't know Java is sort of my language, and I don't want to be programming in Python or or uh, or C." Um, so it was it's just an interesting uh, way around that I came back to Google, uh, w with having this system. So anyway, so we, well, we kind of looked at this and like, this is not a long-term game plan, right? With this cat and mouse game, you just, it's, it's a very short term window that you can capitalize off of, and then it gets shut down. And so we had this epiphany. It was actually my wife's, uh, epiphany, uh, Morris Stoffer, and uh, she, she had this idea of, Hey, why don't we build our own search engine just to show people how, what search engines actually want to see. And uh, obviously back then Google was sharing a lot of its information. So it was easy to see, 
you go to their their search console uh you know, you, there's uh, lots of, of uh, data there that you can see. This is before the not provided fiasco where they started shutting off all the, the data. Um, and and uh, this is before neural nets. So it was very easy to track which algorithms did what. Uh, this is before rank brain. So each search result behaved the same way. It was the same flavor of algorithms from one search result to the next. And so, uh, so it you're was a great time. Engineering. The yeah, it was a great time to reverse reason. engineer all okay. the algorithms because uh, we we had we had a, a very uh, known quantity of algorithms. This is before Panda and Penguin and all that stuff. Right, right. And so once we had the search engine, uh, we every time they added a new algorithm, we already had a control group. So we we had we knew that this was regression tested and this is the settings and everything. And then you know we would screw around trying to figure out what's the algorithm for Panda or Penguin or whatever it happened to be. And we would be able to kind of get close to it. We'd figure out, okay, you know, this is now replicating what we see on, on Google search results. So uh, so our first customer, at, we'll get into this part of it, I guess. Yeah. Leads us oh, wait, the so first, this is, so yeah. that's when you started Market Brew is when you met that couple. Yeah, it was actually called, the company. S yeah, it was called SEO Engine. Okay. Uh, yeah, originally called, it was called SEO ENG. It was this weird, it was, we okay. called it Sion. <laughs> <laughs> and then we turned it into SEO engine and then eventually it became market brew. The, the market brew was okay. sort of like the, the modern version of it, which is many years later, uh, where yeah. we you know, have a whole nother first customers, uh, 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 talk there, but okay. Yeah. The, the SEO engine company, we, uh, I think one of our first, uh, big, uh, clients was sponsored I don't know if you remember sponsored reviews. Um, mm. they were basically like, what we, what we would call an advertorial uh, agency. So they would, you know, allow, there was a, a system that allowed people to go and write guest, guest write stuff. And, you know, you could put links in there and, and, and do essentially link earning or link building uh, based yeah. off of those, those uh, articles. And um, I remember uh, the first time uh, I was just doing the tech side of things at the time, I wasn't really involved in the sales side. And I remember all of a sudden our systems just going down one day and I was like, what's going on? Like, you know, why are we having like 200 times more traffic than what we had before? <laughs> and, uh, and I, you know, get on the phone and I'm like, Hey, you know, it's the, the, my business part, I'm like, what's going on? Did you sign a deal or something? Is there, did somebody, Oh yeah, I just, I just, uh, we just gave access to, you know, uh, this, this, uh, company that's now doing like, you know, effectively 200 times the amount of traffic that we were doing before. And we were still effectively in a beta. This is about, 2008, 2000, uh, yeah, early, early 2008. And so we'd already filed patents on all of this stuff. We have a number of pretty seminal patents that Google sites and IBM sites. Uh, these all started in 2006. Um, and so What's this is when somebody cites a patent. Well, I mean, it basically means that they're using your patent to incorporate uh, part of their patent, right? So they, they wow. they're citing a specific patent saying based off of this, this is already a known thing that somebody has already invented. We're inventing this new thing based off of this idea. So, wow. um, so yeah, so we have over like 130, 140 citations to our, our patent. This is uh, wow. one of the mysteries why I've never, uh, uh, we, we've never really gotten a lot of publicity for this. Uh, SEO industry is very strange. People talk about all kinds of cool things, but they don't actually talk about the real cool stuff, which is like, I think all the patents, SEO by the sea, uh, used to talk about that, obviously, um, but uh, mostly just covered Google's patents. Um, yeah. But anyway, so in 2008, we get this uh, huge demand. Uh, the system was running on uh, My MySQL. Uh, I forget what version, very early version back then. And uh, and so I I, I after uh, basically the system came to a halt. I I uh, spent you know 48 hours triaging this and figuring out a, like. A limitation with MySQL. There was a there was a write limitation to this database, and uh, well, heavy amounts of writes. Essentially, uh, the way that we were using the database uh, wasn't really going to work. So, within a two week period, we rewrote the entire backend in Postgres. Uh, so, Postgres uh, basically uh, another type of database. Um, and so that was our first customer. I uh, the, the the technical side of our first customers where we were just <laughs> basically running around with their heads on fire, uh, hair on fire. And, and this is something that obviously is probably shared with a lot of startups and tech tech companies. Uh, this is often, you know, you don't, you don't solve the scaling part in the beginning. You're just basically 
doing a, a, a minimum viable product and you're just trying to get it out the door and get somebody to, to buy it. And then, uh, you know, if you have early success, uh, this is something that a lot of people run into. All of a sudden, you know, there's the scalability issue and you get all kinds of race conditions and all the performance issues that come with it that you never really thought about this when you were writing the code. So, um, yeah. So yeah, so that was the first customer uh, when we were in the beta stage, and this was a small uh, product. This was uh, you know ninety nine dollars a month and less. Uh, I think we had a thirty nine dollar a month uh, offering. Uh, we had a uh, sixty four thousand customers by the by two thousand nine. Wow! And uh, really was a a B two C product back then. Um, and uh, so you're competing then, with like Mars and. Maybe some yeah, other I mean, early SEO. I don't know if Moz was around yet at that point. Yeah, Moz and um, HubSpot copied a lot of what we did. Um, okay. So the website grader, HubSpot's uh, website grader, that was a direct mm -hmm. copy of, of our, our really? software. Yeah, we never really did anything about that, but that that was just, uh, um, you know, and people talk about like, uh, it was just the right timing, right? So you had different people uh, inventing the same stuff and c coming up with the same tools because it was just sort of like the right, uh, that, that right time and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the ideas and stuff I would see blogged about by Rand Fishkin, uh, later on that we had already kind of introduced on the market to people that were using this part of that 64,000, uh, user base. Yeah. Um, so we, we were, uh, sort of in the background because we weren't very, um, you know, we weren't content writers, blog writers, we were a tech, company basically uh, building yeah. these tools uh, making people money using the the, the, the tool set and this search engine that we had created was your partner so, also like a technical founder he wasn't no okay yeah so, so uh, and so sales focus stuff yeah and so we we uh, uh, we, we basically came to heads and said hey we want to do more of a b2b or enterprise offering here. Uh, because this is this is really you know having a search engine it's really like an advanced you know it's if you if you if you're like the company Tesla you're building the 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 supercharged uh, what what's what's their top end uh, uh, car they basically oh, went after made the most or whatever yeah they they made the most expensive it's like making the most expensive product for the the most advanced teams oh the Roadster um, yeah the Roadster yeah yeah. Yeah, and so uh, and we had this argument, sort of, you know, that he wanted to go keep it B two C, and we we're like, no, it's you know, this everyone's going to build like a B two C platform. It's going to be a commodity, and um, that turned out to be right. Obviously, there was you know Raven Tools and all these other platforms that all kind of got mm -hmm. in the in the mix and became a very a race to the bottom, if you want to think of it that way. A lot of people got washed out um, with that kind of model, and uh, with sixty five thousand, you said. Customers. 64,000, yeah. 64,000. You were like, nah. Uh, was it like the economic costs really weren't lining up as far as like the well, cost all, of I, serving yeah, I mean, that many customers versus- You have to really scale up. A, monthly. Yeah, you have to really scale up a company and the margins aren't as, as high as, as yeah. sort of the high-end products. Um, and so we just felt like the value, we had a, a opportunity to create like this huge margin product that- uh, required, you know, far fewer employees, far fewer, uh, resources and just a higher ROI, uh, approach. And, um, and so, well, we, we bought the company from our, uh, uh partners, we moved on and, and, uh, spent a couple of years kind of figuring out like what this is going to turn into. And then we moved operations back out to Palo Alto, California and went, and started, uh, w w the idea was originally to, we were going to go and raise a, a, seri a series A or a seed round. Didn't know which one it was going to be, but uh, we we wanted to go out and, and uh, kind of figure out what we we're going to do. So we uh, we basically just drove out to, to, to Palo Alto. Uh, we had uh, a couple of, we had two dogs with us. Uh, me and my wife uh, basically just drove out there and, and uh, we had a, a startup accelerator called Plug and Play. Uh, this is in 2014, 2013 ish. Uh, and, uh, you know, rented a, rented a spot in that plug and, uh, that plug and play accelerator. And, uh, the idea was to start, you know, pitching to investors, going up to on Sand Hill and, and talking to all the, the VCs and basically, uh, pitching uh, this idea of, uh, sort of an enterprise product for, you know, the Fortune 500. Or the sort of large in-house SEO teams for for brands, um, 
And so we, we eventually, uh, uh, you know, there's a whole story and there's a whole like chapter. We could talk about this, but yeah. you know, it was pretty <laughs> nuts where we were just basically, uh, putting all the money that we were getting just back into the, the company. We were sort of living very frugally, uh, yeah. just like, you know, a typical startup. We were just, uh, you know, uh, we, we were running like Airbnbs in the beginning. I think we don't, we didn't even have a place to, to stay. Uh, so we were yeah. just, you know, living in the office basically. So you're kind of restarting the company as this restarting it. Yeah. Focus, almost B2B yeah. focus. Yeah. So and, how did you go to that? Like, transition of, Hey, sorry, customers, you can't use our software anymore. Or like, what is that like? Well, so we kept, so we kept, we grandfathered everybody in. So we, we kept all the, the old system in this, uh, in, in, in there for many years. A lot of our customers stayed with us for two, three, four, maybe even more than that, maybe up to like eight or nine years. Uh, cause I think the, the last beta, the, the last retail account probably stopped uh, almost only like a couple years ago. Uh, you just weren't adding new features and correct. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. It, was, it was the old, uh, we would create these little reports basically that, that, that was, uh, sort of the, the, that product. And so anyway, so in 2014, we're going and raising money. I was doing uh, a lot of, uh, uh, pitching to VCs. We would go and, and do, uh, there would be investor days at, at this, uh, startup accelerator all these investors and uh, advisors would come in, you know, potential advisors, people that were looking to be advisors to these companies and, and get a piece of the company or get a role in that company. Uh, and so uh, this public speaking was always a big thing for me. It was easy to do. I liked to do it. I was always a, a performer in life. I, I uh, played the piano. I was a, in a professional drum and bugle corps called the Blue Coats. Uh, so I was a, a, a trumpet player. And would play in front of like you know thirty forty thousand people on a football football field, um, and so that this was like a, a I always liked to, to uh, entertain and talk. So yeah. uh, I took that role really seriously, and and um, uh, turned out to be very very uh, uh, advantageous for for our company because you know we're in front of all these people that be, could be potential clients as well, um, and that's essentially what happened. We we picked up an advisor. Uh, this advisor uh, had former ties to a Fortune 100 company called R.R. Donnelly, uh, and uh, they uh, eventually became one of our first clients. And we started generating so much uh, revenue that we just decided, hey, this is probably uh, better to just you know bootstrap this from here on out than to accept a couple of these offers from VCs. We had gotten a couple $5 million term sheets for Series A, and... Uh, we just didn't like the, we didn't like the setup. We didn't like the control, uh, uh, portions of this. A couple of the VCs said that my wife had to leave. Uh, so that was leave a, the company, leave the company. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't want to have a husband and wife come, uh, uh, a duo. Uh, um, what was her so role? She was the CEO. She was actually, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So Running the we, we made her the CEO time. like immediately, um, when we went out to Palo Alto because, uh, she really, that was kind of a better role for her. She did all the legal, yeah. she did all the contracts. Uh, she was involved in a lot of the sales. She had come up with this whole idea in the first place. <laughs> so I was just kind of the tech person that, that, uh, could turn, you know, ideas into, into real things. And that's how I've always sort of, uh, done things throughout my career. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, so we just decided to turn down a couple of term sheets that, uh, uh, that, maybe a, a younger version of us would have accepted and probably regretted, I think. Um, yeah. but, but so yeah, some re recurring revenue coming in. So yeah. So in we had already booked situation. Yeah, so we had already been booking revenue, uh, based off of just pitching in front of companies, pitching in front of, uh, potential investors or advisors and got, got a, an advisor, uh, involved in that. He wanted to be involved with the company. He, he thought he could bring in uh, uh business. He ended up, um, bringing in this, this very large company to start, got us our first few case studies that, you know, the enterprise level case studies saying, Hey, this thing actually works. They had a, they had a blog uh, network of 30 different micro blogs and uh, they had uh, had a major issue with uh, uh, loss of traffic recently. And so we ran our search engine model on this and uncovered the, this huge uh, 
uh, problem with the way that there were no following links internally. They actually were like, they had links that would link to these yeah. other, it was almost like a pinwheel. They were linking to each, each microblog was linked to the next blog. And <laughs> they had put a no follow link on this template and effectively created this massive loss uh, 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 of page rank within the, that, that uh, uh, link graph. And, and never linking internally to, to the site that the link was coming from. Yeah. And so our system showed this visually. It showed what it was doing to the rankings. And then, I, of course, when they removed it, we could then forecast this. It's one of the cool things about our, our software now is that it's an SEO forecasting tool. You can actually run these calibrated models uh, and, and uh, see what's going to happen. Um, and so this is about 2014, 2015. Um, then Google comes out with RankBrain which essentially changes the whole th the game, right? So instead of having these hard-coded rules uh, that set all the bias and weights of each of these algorithms that make up the search results, they have this thing called the Quality Rater Guidelines. And this is a, a list of, of what they want uh, their search results sort of to look like. They give it to a bunch of humans to, to look at a bunch of sites and say, yeah, this is a good site, this is a bad site, it's effectively labeling this neural net that they created uh, that they would then feed into this machine learning process to, you know, create a search results that looked like what the, the quality raters were trying to say would be good results for the user. And what this effectively did was uh, change all the bias and weight settings on all these algorithms uh, from, you know, one search result to the next. And this, this was a huge problem that we had because, you know, one of the major issues when selling this was people just didn't believe that we had a search engine like Google. Like they're like, well, they couldn't fathom. They're like, well, then why don't you just be Google? Not yeah. understanding like there's a whole different other problem to, to uh, tackle what Google's doing versus just creating the statistical model of Google. And, uh, and then we would say, you know, we've regression tested all the, the algorithms. We, we know what the main algorithms are. And then, then they would say, you know, but how do you know what, you know, settings, all the algorithms are. And this was, these are valid questions at the time yeah. because, uh, you know, we, we really, you know, here, here we are with a uh, regression tested model, but now Google is changing, you know, every month, the, the, the flavor of the, of the search results. So we ended up uh, having a major discovery in 2015. And uh, this was uh, uh, just uh, me looking through a bunch of, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, uh, data over the years. And we I came across this genetic algorithm called particle swarm optimization. And what this genetic algorithm does is it sort of simulates a, a swarm of insects or birds uh, and, and the way that it solves things. Uh, it, it can be used in like annealing. Uh, uh, so pr problem solving for like annealing uh, metals and uh, liquids and stuff like that. And there's a, a whole list of uh, different applications. But one of the applications uh, that kind of the light bulb went off in my head was, hey, we could we could make all of the bias and weight settings of these algorithms, uh, sort of each one of these could become like a particle that we that we can then optimize or use this particle storm optimization to, uh, to figure out what is the flavor of these algorithms such that our search engine model will produce what we see. And so uh, that was a major discovery that sort of catapulted what Market Brew is today, where today now you can go in the system, you, you give it a keyword, it points it at a specific search result. Uh, we pull, you know, SEM Rush's API to just get the rankings for that search result. And then we say, based off of these rankings, adjust our algorithm such that it behaves the same way. So that you can go in and search on Marker Brew, and it looks just like Google. It's like a Google simulator, if you want to think of it that way. And you can okay. do this for yeah, you know, mobile, sense. desktop, any region of Google. You could make up your own search results and have it try to calibrate. And as long as it makes sense, you know, it'll 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 you know uh, adapt its model to to perform that way. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, that's sort of the first customer was. Uh, it was a it was a life you know kind of a, a game changer for us because you know, we, we would have gone a totally different way, raised capital and sort of created our own job, if you want to think of it that way, versus yeah. like what we have now, which is, you know, we have full control of the company. Uh, we've been able to make, you know, uh, organic decisions throughout the, the years to grow the company in, in a real way. Um, a lot of this was really something we wanted to do 
based off of back in the gravitate days in the early 2000s yeah. you know we went through the whole dot com bubble we raised millions of dollars and found ourselves you know trying to figure out what to do because we didn't have enough revenue coming in for the amount of money that we had already raised and uh, that was mm. a a whole uh life lesson sort of what that i've yeah. gone through so it was that was a you know we would go and now uh, i would go and talk to uh, budding entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. This is about, you know, 2014, 2015. Uh, and I would talk to them after we'd already kind of decided, hey, we don't need to uh, raise money because we, we focused on actually generating revenue. Um, and so Google had this thing called uh, uh, um, Google for, I think it was Google for Entrepreneurs, I think is the name of it. And um, uh, a man by name of Fadi Bashura that was heading up this, he had rent, uh, rented a house in, in Palo Alto and he would invite entrepreneurs from all over the world to come to Silicon Valley to see sort of how Silicon Valley worked. And he would give speakers uh, uh, every day to, to you know, different, different speakers that would give different experiences of, of uh, their time at, in the Silicon Valley. And of course, we had been there for almost a decade at that point uh, with different companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would get up and, and actually my wife and I would we'd, we would sit there and talk about how, first of all, being a, a husband and wife uh, startup and, and doing the search engine yeah. and also just talking about how, hey, you don't need to raise money. Uh, everybody else, is, all those other speakers were basically telling them how to raise money and how to how to uh, build a pitch deck and all these things. And right. here I come and I'm saying, well, you don't have to do that. Like that's that there's another option is, is to sort of build a company uh, and bootstrap it. Um, and you know, there's no one right way. This, you know, if you're going to go B to C, sometimes the best way to do it is scale quick and fast, and that's the way to do it. Uh, I'm I'm sure you've already talked to a bunch of speakers who have uh, yeah. have have done that and, and done it successfully. So, uh, but our our path was uh, slightly different, and it's turned out very well. I, I'm we're very happy the way things have turned out. Um, you know, you end up having to do a little bit more this way. You don't get to be in your little role that you like to do. You have to be a little bit more outside your comfort zone. Uh, you have to learn how to do all the aspects of everything in your company. Uh, so, you know, I had to get back into uh, doing sales and uh, doing the marketing and all this stuff and, and build the everything out from top to top to bottom and all the different uh, parts of the company. So, but that's the, uh, that, that's sort of the the two. I have two first customers uh, experiences right. with almost the same company. It's same right. same idea. We really two different companies, but uh, yeah, that was that was. I've got the, a couple questions. Yeah, uh, that came up while you were talking. Um, first, so you were talking about when you were pitching investors or potential investors, and when you were relaunching the company, and you were saying like you were considering either C, like Series A round versus seed round. What's the difference there between? those two different types of funding and like, well, it's really just dependent on sort of where you are uh, as a company. Right. So typically a seed round is you, you don't really have uh, uh, customers yet. Uh, you're, you don't even have a product yet really sometimes. Right. So it depends on uh, what era of Silicon Valley you're talking about, but uh, you know, uh, you, you're typically coming at, you have an idea, you have the, the product in, in motion, uh, you may have come up with a minimum viable product, as they say. So you have sort of a prototype. And so this is something where a seed round would, would uh, be appropriate, where you have uh, individual investors typically uh, who would come in and say, hey, I, I, will, I will give you, you know, 50000 or 100000 to to go and uh, hire some engineers to finish this, this product or hire, uh, uh, you know, whoever you need to do to complete and get, get it to the point where you can start selling the, the product. Whereas a Series A is some is, is sort of a company that has already demonstrated that they have uh, a, a revenue generating business, right? So they they already okay. have their first few customers, and they're trying to figure out how to scale scale everything. And so we didn't really know where we were at the time because the old the old company we we were kind of in a Series A, like we we already had lots of customers and we were ready to scale. Uh, but the new company was an enterprise company, a totally new type of product, and we had very few customers. It was just a, you know, it almost looked like a, a prototype type of company, even though we had these, you know, 10 years of code base, we had patents on everything, trademarks, you know, all the things that you would see with a Series A company. So, yeah, so we were kind of in a, in, in a weird situation because not many people even 
last that long, right? Like no companies that are, yeah. are past two, three years, they're typically, if they don't, if they don't make it, they're done. And, that, and it's not a company anymore. So, and, and so that's, that's sort of what we, uh, the challenges that we ran into between the two, but the, those are the differences. Do they take, do they ask for like different amounts of ownership typically between the two, like seed versus series A, like what's that dynamic look like? Yeah. I mean, so typically it's, it's, uh, it's really not about the ownership. It's about the control, right? So in a seed round, th there's not as much control, uh, desired. It's usually individual investors that just want a piece of the pie so that when, uh, a VC comes along, eventually they, you know, they get, they get cashed out or they get rolled okay. into the, the series A, uh, and, and they're more advisors typically they're, 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 you know, seed round investors want to, uh, want to be a little bit more involved and that's good or bad. Right. So if you get somebody who's right. very helpful and somebody can help you, uh, doing something, uh, that, that you wouldn't be able to do or connect you to people that you wouldn't be able to be connected to before, uh, that's great. Uh, there's also horror stories where people just, you know, want to be, you know, what's going on, what's going on. Like every day, just basically, uh, the, the worst side of, of everything where you're just being micromanaged, uh, and somebody who's just, you know, really worried about what their money is doing every single minute of the day. Um, right. and so, which is something that's very negative for a startup trying to focus on, they have to, you have to be hyper-focused and laser focused on something and getting something done and, and shipping a product. Um, and whereas the series A is, is really, uh, it's, it's a dance, right? Um, for young entrepreneurs, it's a very scary situation because they don't understand what they're signing. Uh, they just see the money, right? So they get flashed, you know, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, depends on the, the, the obviously the, uh, the history of it. But um, what's happening is effectively you've got these sharks that know exactly how to write contracts, exactly know, you know, where, where yeah. they're going to be in two years uh, and what they want to, what they want the structure of the company to look at. They'll always ask for a board seat. Uh, you know, they, you, they want to incorporate, you know, C Corp. They want a board seat on the board or two. They'll say that they'll have a neutral board member. Uh, but really they're, they're, they really are tied to the VC and they'll just do what the VC is going to do eventually. Anyways, it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's a little game that they play that they, uh, what ends up happening to a lot of these young investors or young entrepreneurs is that, uh, you know, they're so gung ho about the money and the technology. They're just like, let's do it. And then a couple years later, they don't even run the company anymore or they're, they get fired. Some, some of them don't even yeah. uh, like they're, they're literally lose the company. Um, and they don't, uh, they don't understand like the, uh, how much control means, uh, hmm. for a company. It's not so much how much you, uh, how many shares you have in the company, because if you control the company, you can, you can effectively change the you know dilution rates and, and, uh, all kinds of different things as part of the, uh, structure of the company later on. So, yeah. That makes sense. Thank you for explaining that. Cause I wasn't sure some of those details and you've been through, it seems like the entire life cycle of Silicon Valley, or at least the last, you know, 20, 30 years. A lot of um, it. <laughs> <laughs> the other point that, that stood out uh, was when you said, you know, people would say, well, why don't you just start your own search engine? If, if you've got all this, you know, similar technology or you're, you're saying that you're, you know, similarly skilled and all that. Um, and you, you briefly mentioned how it's a, it's a totally different problem you're solving or totally different ball game. Could you touch on that difference a little more? Like what, sure. it, what would it require for you to be like, yeah, we're going to go after Google versus just having the model that you have or the simulator versus actually, I guess what gathering the data and trying to store. Yeah. And... It's, it's just a larger scale problem, right? So we used to have a thing called like the link neighborhood and this would go out and crawl just like uh, I would, I would presume, like Ahrefs would 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 have today, um, or any of the other search engines in the past. You know, uh, Bleco was was a, was a search engine a long time ago, and uh, U.com is a is one here that's just come on the scene. Um, so these are uh, hugely scalable. You know, uh, hugely uh, um, uh, expensive problems, right? Like it's okay. it's not a it's a different. In, in order to play that game, you have to have a, a ton of funding, right? You have, you have, it's a huge I risk see. up front. You're basically just saying, Hey, here, we need at least like 20 million just for the server farms to Whoa. go out and, and, and crawl, gotcha. like do the web crawling and indexing and scoring and all that stuff and keep that refreshed constantly. 
because you're uh, that's scan, not- like you're crawling the whole internet basically or as much as yes is yes worth and you scanning. have to like it, you can't the way that the page rank calculation works wow. this goes back to the original google uh page rank uh patent is that you have to have the whole link graph in order to to solve that calculation it's an iterative calculation that requires not just the the, the page that you're looking at to to score, but you have to have all the links that link to that page. And in other words, uh, you have to have already crawled all the pages that link to this page. And oh, by the way, you also need to know the page rank of those pages as well. So that means you've got to go crawl all the links that went to that, eat all those backlink pages as well. And it just recursively keeps going and going and going. So you have to have essentially the whole link graph or a large part of it, large portion of it to get an accurate reading of, of what's happening. Uh, whereas what we do at Marker Brew is we build statistical models. So you will put in, as a user, you'll put in a keyword search, uh, let's say dog food, right? And you get the mm-hmm. search results for dog food. And what we will do is then crawl all the sites that are in that ranking, uh, those ranking positions. Uh, we will go and pull a backlink structure to each one of those sites uh, using, you know, a backlink tool like Ahrefs or something like that to basically uh, build that the 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 backlink structure behind all of that. What we're doing is we're building a, a statistical model of that link graph, and we do it in a very smart way. Of course, it has to be done so that it's very precise. So you're you're scoring you're still scoring things at first principles level. We go down to the individual links, and we have all these link algorithms that get applied to each link, so that we know exactly how much link equity each link is passing. Uh, so the 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 amount of of processing. Uh, at the lower layer is it's tremendous compared to what a typical traditional SEO tool would do. Uh, but what that results in is a very, very precise picture of things like the link flow distribution or the link graph. And these are really important concepts when you're trying to model what's actually happening inside of a search engine, why things are ranking the, uh, a certain way. Um, so even though so it's yeah, a lot yeah. more than most other tools, probably it's a different or, problem that you're solving. Yeah. But it's still uh, not, the same level of processing or data storage and everything as running a full on search engine. Correct. Now, yeah. if somebody came to me and said, you know, if, if you.com or uh, uh, Microsoft or somebody said, hey, we'd yeah. like to integrate Market Brew into our search engine, would you come on our team and basically, you know, <laughs> w- would you, would you uh, uh, take all your tooling and these statistical yeah. modeling system and we'll just put it into our search engine? It would be a pretty, pretty painless transition because everything yeah. we're doing in Market Brew effectively is being done at, at these te- at these other search engine teams. They're, they're all writing. It's all the same stack, right? You have the, you have the, the crawling stack, you have the indexing, the scoring, the query parser on top. Uh, so all of this stuff is basically uh, the same structure, the same idea. Um, so yeah, it's, it, the, it's just a different scale, right? You're doing things at a totally different scale. So when you're crawling links, so you're only crawling the links related to, you know, whatever rankings are associated with a given keyword that somebody puts in, um, like how deep do you crawl? Like, so you crawl the links on those sites, I guess, or that the page related to whatever keyword, that, let's say just that number one site that shows up as a competitor, sure. to somebody who put in a keyword. You, you crawl all the links on those pages and then do you crawl the links on those? Like how far yeah. out do you, you go? Right. So that's one of the th- things that you have to, when you're building this, the search engine model is you got to figure out where do you stop? Right. Yeah. Uh, and it's both forward and backwards, right? So, so like how far back do you internet. go? How far forward do you go with the link structure? Okay. And that's a, yeah. that's a, that's a hyper parameter of these search engine models. You, you have to figure oh. out what, what this looks like. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So what you're referring to is basically like how, how broad that link graph is going to be. So mm-hmm. we crawl these sites in the in the search results, and then we got to visit all those links on each of these pages. And then we also, you know, have to go at least one level deeper, right? So we got to go to the sites that it links to and crawl all those pages as well. And then if right. we have, obviously we have an option to continue crawling. It just uh, there's a sort of a parameter that we set to figure out how much of the model that we need to do. We have we actually have a neural net that will learn. Uh, how precise it needs to be and feed that back into the web crawlers so wow. that we know exactly how much that we need to crawl. So for a site like Walmart that has, you know, hundred, uh, tens of millions of pages, uh, we don't have to take their servers down every time we do a crawl. <laughs> well, what we do is we just gotcha. run this and we build this, but we just visit certain pages in the, in the site so that we know that we have sort of a, a, a good model, a good precise model of what's actually happening uh, for the whole entire link graph. 
So that's so why we're able to okay. crawl a site like that in a few hours that, versus like if you use something like Screaming Frog, it might take like weeks and it would take the server down and you get a bunch of phone calls yeah, from the sure. IT, I, IT staff. So Because it's just brute force crawling everything where yours, Correct. you have like kind of an AI that's like, we get the picture. We, we see yeah. the, enough of the data. And Correct. it's... And so for, you've got, I guess, testing and evidence to where even though you're not crawling every single piece of the Internet or every single piece of a site, that your algorithm or AI is accurate based right. on. Yeah, yeah. So you okay. you can actually the, – the whole point of the, the search engine model is it's transparent. So uh, you don't – it's not a black box like Google is today. Uh, you right. can actually go in and see how everything works. You can see the predictions that it makes. And then you can just look at your rank trackers 60 days from now, essentially. It takes about 45 to 60 days uh, whenever you make a change to go through Google, get re-indexed, re-scored, all the rankings change. Uh, and then the rank trackers scrape that and pick that up in the rank trackers or your Google Analytics, however you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. And you can confirm what Market Brew predicted versus what you see on the rank trackers. And there's this relationship between the two. Uh, of course, it's not a you know perfect relationship. Sometimes we overshoot, sometimes we undershoot. Uh, but there's yeah. a consistent ratio, a relationship that versus what we predict in the in the models versus what you see in your rank trackers, and it, it holds pretty pretty linear through through time. You could kind of guess once you see it one time, you could kind of see okay, this is what it's predicting now. This is what yeah. we expect to happen. So now, so you have like, and do you call it an AI? Is it like an adaptive AI that you can just you're confident now that like no matter what changes they make. It seems like it's so flexible that because it's yeah, looking it, at what exists and it, just adjusting itself. Yeah. So this so is like whatever they do. It this seems is a like. common problem with with neural nets and machine learning in general. Right. It's okay. really hard to describe what it's doing. Even the even yeah. the machine learning engineers who who build the, the, the machine learning process. Right. Often, hmm. you know, sometimes only two, three hundred lines of code. I think Andre Karpathy, I just watched a video on him build nano GPT. And it was like oh. 300 lines of code, basically. Uh, you know, it does everything. It does all the reinforcement learning and the uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent and all the, the link, uh, the, the minimizing all the losses and does all the machine learning, all that stuff. All that stuff can be done in two or 300 lines of code. But to describe what it's actually doing, once it's learned what the neural, uh, the neural net has learned what it, the settings and the, all the bias and weight settings that it needs to apply, it's still very hard to understand what is it, what's it actually doing? So we view our it's search engine model as a uh, specific applied uh, machine learning machine learner. Uh, so okay. think of it that way, right? So we have a machine learning system that's machine learning a machine learning system. Uh, and this is a specific version of it. It's a, it's a search engine machine learning system. Uh, you could probably you don't apply use AI necessarily as a phrase. Well, AI is, is so the particle storm optimization is in itself a, an artificial intelligence. Uh, oh, okay. application. It's a genetic algorithm that is a form of, of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, we have a number of, of AI type uh, systems in, in embedded in a, in a system to make it work. But um, yeah, you think of it, I would cate categorize it as a machine learning machine learner, if you want to think of it that way. So you can now, I guess it's set up to analyze, obviously, like search engines and reverse engineer them basically and figure out rankings right now yeah anytime the rankings can... change uh we'll see that in the rank trackers we say hey that looks different than what our model looks like and we can re-trigger this calibration process it effectively relearns mm -hmm. what the flavor of those search results are now yeah and then in doing that we can track over time what what changed so our users can go in and say you know when, like uh, in December, this, we're filming this in early 2023. So the, the helpful content update just occurred on Google. Right. Uh, and uh, 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 so the 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 prognosticators and the gurus out there, you know, on on social media often go back and forth on, hey, this is what we need to do now, or this is what we, you know, and Google will send out a bunch of PR, which is all just you know general uh, advice. It doesn't ever point you into what to actually do for obvious <laughs> reasons. Um, but uh, with Marker Brew, uh, you can just log in, look at your models, and you can see, hey, like the expertise algorithm that we developed a couple years ago, this is more important now because uh, Google's neural net, you know, the, the quality rater guidelines uh, led these humans to basically rate sites that uh, look more expert writing uh, higher, mm -hmm. and that fed into the machine learning, and now all of a sudden the, this 
expertise algorithm that we modeled. Uh, it's not the same code as Google. It's, they may have totally right. different systems that measure this, but we have a expertise algorithm that we embody in the model. And this expertise algorithm now is more important it, as part of the model. And so you can see this in the model. You can see, hey, this we should be spending more time on building, you know, topic clusters and, and filling out the, the gap in content that we're that, that this al expertise algorithm is measuring. Um, so yeah, and do you so, see that? Does it line up with what Google's saying? Like, because they'll announce and say, "Hey, expertise is more important, or experience is more important." And you're seeing that. You feel like, like in the algorithm, as it measures what's changing, that 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 is lining up with what they're saying in that case. Usually, way later than what they say. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so, uh, like you know, like Core Web Vitals uh, was released. We didn't see any correlation with Core Web Vitals for a while. Now we're starting to see correlation with a lot of uh, uh, LCP, least contentful paint, uh, largest contentful paint. I forget the, yeah. the, the yeah. acronym, but right. essentially the we're seeing uh, the and the expertise algorithm, right? So this is the E and the EAT. Uh, we're starting to see more of this in a lot of the your money in your life keywords. Uh, so that you know medical and legal and those types of okay. uh, search results, we're seeing a little bit more. Uh, uh, swaying to that that algorithm as is being more dominant uh, out of all the algorithms in the system, um, but uh, it, it's quite remarkable how often the the algorithms change now uh, week to week. You can see slight variation in these boost factors inside of Market Brewer's model. You can see it like you know almost kind of like a noise signal, uh, and, yeah. and that's that's uh, you know it's unnerving for SEOs because if you figure out how to do something in one search result, but that doesn't translate to any other search result now. <laughs> in fact, it won't even translate to that search result in a month from now because wow. it's, it, it's likely that it could be entirely different. And there's so much noise involved that you could get, you could get faked out very easily. You could say, Hey, hmm. uh, this looks way more important. And you, you put all your resources in optimizing one thing at the expense of another. And now that other thing is now more important than that the month later. So uh, it, trying yeah. to, uh, trying to get a good signal to noise ratio is very important. And to do that, you really have to have all this, all, all this tooling to figure out what, what's going on. Cause you really can't do it manually anymore. You could almost have like a daily or weekly show like, Hey guys, here's what changed in the algorithm based on our, what our models are saying. But I guess in your yep. case, you, you don't want to give that piece of gold. unless they're a customer. <laughs> That's what they pay for. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, the tool itself. Yeah, and, and going back to like, you know, if Microsoft bought us or you.com bought us or something like that, that would be something that we do, right? So we, we could, you could basically, you could actually, you know, uh, expose a lot of what Google's doing that way. If you were a competitor to Google or something like that, you could wow. use us that way. We don't, we try to play nice with Google and, and we want to, uh, be around in the era of Google. <laughs> so we don't, we don't attack, uh, the, yeah. the feeds us, but. <laughs> right. Because you're not now, because earlier on, let's clear something up. You mentioned that maybe you were doing some black hat tactics way back in the day because of that's just how the market was and not even knowing the different kind of lay of the land or the rules that Google had. But now you wouldn't call anything that market brews doing black hat, right? I mean, it's just information that people can use to adjust stuff on their site. You're not actually... Like yeah, we don't. We, anything we have auto. Internet. Yeah, so we have auto generating tasks in the system, and we wouldn't consider any of those black hat. We try to conform everything to what Google's guidelines are. We we want to steer cool. our customers away from any kind of red flags or Google penalties. Right. Um, but it's all subjective, right? You see things like like the ChatGPT thing that's come out, and all this AI okay. content yeah. generation, right? Is that black hat or white hat, right? I'd love uh, to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> well, I mean. One of the things that people are struggling with is can can Google understand if it's AI generated? And uh, you know, people are saying, "Oh, there's going to be a watermark and all these." You know, right? Uh, the the from a search engineer's perspective, I can tell you that it's very very hard to detect whether something is con is is AI generated specifically because there's so many ways to fool it. You could just chain one content writer with the next, and boom, the watermark's gone, right? Uh, you can hmm. you can take the output of ChatGPT and put it into Quillbot, and you know gotcha. basically rewrite the thing. And now all of a sudden, any kind of uh, pattern that you're trying to look for as a search engineer to determine whether or not it's AI generated or not is is gone. So um, even with all the AI powers or the machine learning powers you have to reverse engineer the friggin' Google algorithm itself, but the output generated 
is a harder task than that. Yeah, it's it's it yes and no, right? So okay. uh, given you, it's hard to detect if it's AI generated or not, um, but we still we still have the ability to we still have a bunch of tools that we can detect quality, right? So we can detect okay. to topic clustering, we can detect how well the level of expertise that writing is, which obviously you know these AI content writers are going to generate higher expertise scores. So that's you're seeing a lot of like CNET and Bankrate just came out with a bunch of AI content that's performing very well on the market today. Mm -hmm. um, but but the 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 idea that you can just generate hundreds of thousands of these pages, uh, you know, programmatic SEO. A lot of people right. call it this way. Um, you know, you know. First of all, Google knew how to fix this back in the Shelby days, our Shelby days back in 2007. They created the yeah. supplemental index because of it. And then caffeine came along and merged the supplemental index with the regular index. And that, you know, it, it got clouded as to what exactly the supplemental index is anymore. But they had the tooling yeah. to do that back then. And of course, we figured out what they were doing and we wrote that into our model. So we have this thing <laughs> called the link neighborhood score. And there's an inbound score and an outbound score. And effectively, what it's doing is it's just looking at the link graph for the pages that it's been created. And it looks at what, what is the average uh, link equity per page that's being uh, calculated throughout the site. So if you have a small backlink structure to a site and it's doing very well and you're like, hey, this AI content's rocking, now we're just gonna generate like a thousand more pages. Well, unless you unless you increase that, that link graph, that backlink structure commensurately with your content increase, your <laughs> average link equity per page is gonna fall dramatically. It can uh, by, by okay. a tenth or a hundredth or a how, however many pages you decide to, to generate. And once that gets to a certain point, these models can easily see, and these algorithms can really easily see that this this there's it's what we call thin content, essentially. You've got a lot of content, but nobody's linking to it. And that just looks artificial. It's very easy to okay. pick out. And so you may have high expertise scores across the board, but your your uh, your uh, link neighborhood is going to be so low that uh, you're likely going to get demoted uh, hmm. if it's even going to get ranked at all in the first place. So wow. yeah, so there's no way there's no uh, easy way or, uh, around it. It's not really it's not a golden ticket to to SEO success yeah. and dreams. It, it is for sites that have already established themselves who really just haven't written all the content that they want to write about gotcha. like domain experts on, on whatever they are domain experts about. And they just, okay. you know, they haven't they have gone in gaps. Yeah. So any gaps of content uh, or existing content that they have that they may want to rewrite so that it's more focused on certain keywords. Uh, you know, it does really good with gotcha. the orthogonality of content. What I mean by that is you can put up, you can ask chat GPT to put up, 200 pages of content about 200 different ideas and they will be very little overlapping between all the pages there's very little hmm. duplicate content uh what that means is that each page is gonna is gonna stand on its own it's gonna generate its own revenue its own traffic you're not gonna have one page masking three or four other pages because google tends to only want to pick the, the best out of all the documents that come back in its index so if you have you know, 100 pages, but 99 of them are all talking about the same similar topics and the content shows up as sort of like the similar topic cluster, it's only going to pick one out of that 99 every time. So you really only effectively have two pages that you're going to rank for uh, out of the 100. Wow. So, uh, yeah, so there's different different strategies and stuff like that. The whole idea with Marker Brew is that we can kind of model that and see when what that's happening and how it's working. And a lot of the AI generated sites that we're seeing today in Marker Brew is uh, very orthogonal. It's it, you don't see a lot of that duplicate content. It's, it helps with that tremendously. So with Market Brew, you can find whatever gaps you might have. Uh, so whether it's a content gap or a topic gap, you can say, "Hey, here's that gap. Go write content." Yeah, or and it's it, like we a use, gap in we the link the, side. You don't have enough links for this or that. Go yeah, get any part of the algorithms more. you can do this for in Market Brew. The whole point is. Uh, we, we created, and this took way too long for us to figure this out. Uh, we only figured this out maybe two or three years ago. Before then, it was very complicated, I think, as a tool. But today, it's very easy to read because we do this thing called task by comparison. So this is just uh, shorthand for we take the, the best outperforming site in each algorithm in the search engine, and we use that as sort of the goalpost. We say copy what they do. 
And it's easy to just not worry about like how this algorithm works. We can just copy what they do and, and worry about the intricacies of how, you know, the, the, the semantic algorithm uh, mm. works. Uh, we'll leave it up to like the, the hardcore users or the advanced SEO uh, professionals. But uh, the whole idea is we wanted to take a team of, of 10 people down to one person with this tool, not the other way around. And so uh, for every algorithm, uh, it'll tell you what you need to do. It'll, it'll say, hey, here's your content gap. And we were talking about the topic clusters here. It'll show you the site that does the best with topic clustering. It, it says, here's the best topic cluster uh, in this search result. And, and they're performing the best. It's, you know, if, if we found good correlation with this algorithm versus rankings, it'll tie that directly to the rankings so you can see exactly how that's affecting their ranking standing versus all the other sites that are performing less in that uh, algorithm. So it's, it's, a, it's a direct competitive analysis tool. Everything is in context. So you're not just optimizing something for the point of optimizing or doing it with sort of no end goal in mind. You have a specific site that is sort of the model candidate that you use to, to perform on. Incredible tool. Um, I feel like we need like a, a live question and answer feed. Once people start to realize what you're saying that market brew can do for people, it's like, Hey, do you want to rank in Google or not? Use market <laughs> brew. <laughs> what would you say is like the target audience for market brew? Cause you mentioned, you know, you went from, B to C to B to B. So who's like the ideal customer? I mean, our ideal customers before were sort of the, uh, the large brands in very competitive markets, right? Where, you know, tiny little ranking shifts mean millions of dollars of revenue. Uh, so, you know, these in-house teams, it was, uh, we, we would do a few startups that wanted to compete with large companies uh, and we would help them do that, uh, that were, you know, obviously backed by VC money and they had the money to spend to have this, all this powerful complex tooling uh, set up. Uh, we right, because if you have a new website, it seems like, like you don't even need a tool yet. It's like you got to start or do you, can you work with like a new company if they have funding? We can't, yeah, so we, zero. They're just literally can't. launching their site. Yeah, we can. Uh, it, it takes longer, obviously, for all right. of you that know SEO. It takes a long time to, to get started because you have to build this backlink structure behind the, the domain. It has to be all connected to the rest of the link graph in, in the world. So it takes that takes time. Uh, right. So it's easier to do it with a company that already has a backlink structure that their site is just not optimized right and it's not set up correctly. Maybe the content's missing or something like that. Um, so yeah, the, the, it's definitely uh, doable. What we've done in the last three or four years though, is what we're starting to realize is, um, you know, either we either have to turn into an agency ourselves, it's a bunch of search engineers and we don't really want to do that. So what we're doing is we're partnering with agencies. And so, uh, what we, what we're starting to become is sort of like the search engineer team for all the agencies. So, uh, a lot of agencies are looking to sort of gain a competitive advantage on the tech side and have their own tech stack. And part of that tech stack is becoming market brew. We're, we're basically there uh, as both advisors and uh, uh, tool, tool, tool keepers, basically. We're building these tool stacks for all of them to go and uh, use uh, for their own clients. So we're, we're slowly moving into like the ma mass market now. It's kind of the Tesla model. We started with the, uh, the Roadster and then the Model X and now the uh, Model S and uh, Model Y, <laughs> Model 3, Model Y. So that's effectively what we're doing is over time, we're making it more and more efficient. Uh, and we're letting these agencies price things at, at their own pricing levels. They can sell individual search engine models that, you know, uh, are hosted on their own, you know, servers that we've set up for them. So that you can have multiple tenants on the same server and it's a ch cheaper offering for individual clients of those agencies, as opposed to just having to build your own servers and, and have a, a, a massive uh, um, investment in, in this. So, yeah. So you are building back down towards a similar model, which you had before, but maybe not, do you know, yeah. do you know how far you're going to go back that direction? After yeah. Going I mean, eventually, all the way to the road yeah I, eventually we could get down to the, uh, to that same pricing model. Eventually, uh, if we have enough adoption, it's really just, uh, uh, the, the, how, how well we do with, you know, pushing our, uh, agency model and, and working with agencies. Um, it's so far, it's been really good. It's, we were only not even a year into it. So it's still, we're still in the prototyping stage and figuring out what agencies want, what they don't want and all this stuff. Um, but it's, uh, it's going to be a, an amazing journey, I know. So that's where, sort of where we're headed. 
Cool. And I guess full disclosure, I'm a partner at the nine, which is an agency that has been using market brew. And, uh, that's how I met Scott and it has been amazing for the projects we've used it on. And so highly recommend anybody listening or any agencies out there. Um, or I guess, is that the current push more agencies or is it more higher level or is it, is it the agency push? I mean, we don't, uh, we're not trying to service any of these brands anymore. So we just hand yeah. them off to our agencies. Uh, so we don't really care. We'll, you know, we continue to, to, uh, uh, do the marketing and, and, uh, uh, promoting all the data that we find and all the research and stuff uh, out there at the behest of all of the agencies. And obviously the agencies can do that on their own as well with their own internal case studies and, uh, the way that they promote their, their own business models and stuff. Um, but yeah, we're, we don't really care about like, we don't have a specific target market in mind. We yeah. know that we've done very well at the upper echelon of, of sites and these large companies tend to, to be, uh, have, have been the early adopters essentially of the technology, primarily just because of the price point. It's a larger price point than most, uh, we set up Amazon AWS servers and they're just crunching, uh, constantly crunching numbers and, and processing. It's a heavy amount of processing yeah. to do this. It's a, it's not a game where you just, uh, write a search engine, uh, one day and, and get it running. <laughs> it takes a little bit. So this isn't for somebody who's just looking to replace like Ahrefs or no, SEM no. rush, like at the, it's just a couple hundred a month. Yeah. We always recommend to have those tools anyways, like okay. Ahrefs and, and SEM rush. Uh, and, and there's a bunch of free tools out there as well. Uh, yeah. you know, these are all things that give you sort of like the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the starter package of what you need to do with SEO. When you get into the point where you're at the second page of, of search results, or you're at the bottom of the first page and you're just, you can't figure out like what is separating your site from the, the, the top three sites. That's where you turn to a tool like market brew where it, okay. makes, you know, can make a difference in, in, uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars right. of, of revenue for you. Uh, then, then market brew is a very cheap alternative. If you think of it that way, because a uh, small investment in, in building these servers out for your team and, and getting the tooling so that the team can see exactly what they need to do and, and execute on that and then monitor it. Once you get there, then right. obviously it makes sense. So, yeah. Yeah. That clarifies it. If you want to get to the very top of results, market brew, but not for your random hobby blog site. It needs to be for a business you're making. Money Maybe from. for a hobby blog. Like if you're going after a long tail <laughs> keyword that is, doesn't have a lot of search traffic, that's going to be, you know, you don't need us for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, real quick, let's do a couple little rapid fire questions. Um, and I, I think you've answered some of it along the way, as far as what tactics you're using or have used to get customers over the years. Um, but let's just go through a quick list and you can kind of yes or no, or, or talk more about it if you want. Uh, let's start off with traditional marketing tactics. Um, do you, you, have you used in the past or do you guys currently use like face-to-face -face meetings, cold calls, or like cold mailers, like physical mail? Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously we've been doing this for a while, so the times right. have changed quite, quite considerably. Um, you know, when we were, uh, just starting out, uh, you know, back in 2006, uh, I know our sales team would go to the, you know, the better business bureau and they would go and, <laughs> and just like an agency model, really like you're, you're, yeah. you're going in local businesses and, uh, setting up, uh, meetings where you're physically, you know, going to the, the place. And this is back in 2006 and seven. So this is a different time. We didn't have zoom and we didn't have work from home type of thing. So, um, so that, that, that was absolutely something that we did even when we went and did sort of like version two of market brew out in Silicon Valley in 2014, 2013, uh, you know, we were out there pitching to investors, pitching to, uh, other businesses. Um, so, you know, if you're in a, if you're in a city like New York, San Francisco, LA, Seattle, you know, this is a opportunity for you that you can go to the, you know, big, big, uh, events and put yourself out there and yeah. try to try to sell, uh, that way. And obviously you're, physically local, you can, you can go and set up uh, meetings with representatives of companies at their, at their location. So absolutely. We've done that in the past and definitely okay. recommend it still. I guess you can't really replace that whole living in the city where it's totally related to your industry. Like with all the digital tools, there's still something different about the face to face, even though we've got, you know, these kind of zoom type interactions, but it, it's still not exactly the same, huh? 
Yeah, I mean, person to person interaction is is really different, right? I mean, it's just developing relationships and uh, you know I, something about having a um, shared experiences, shared environment that yeah. that really makes a difference. What about newspaper, magazine ads, or like bulletin boards? We put a business card or flyer on it. Um, I mean, we've we've uh, our, I guess the 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 version that we would be doing today would be industry publications, you know. So we would we we often will uh, uh, have an article published uh, about something we've learned or, or something that we've done, and uh, or just in sort of an advertorial type of thing where we'll we'll say this mm-hmm. is uh, new new features that we have. Um, back in the day when press releases were like all the all the the big thing. Uh, you know, you, you could purchase press releases and they would go out and sort of, yeah. as sort of like the kind of mo- modern version of it. Um, I mean, yeah. Some of those are print magazines or like maybe. Uh, yeah, we did. We, we had a few, we had a few actually. Uh, there was a, a, a visibility magazine, I think is, is a, hmm. a publication that would publish uh, a magazine of like all the digital marketing stuff going on. This was in like 2000, 2009, 2010, maybe. Uh, and so we, we did that back then. I don't think you have it too much anymore because people just don't consume things like that anymore. Right. Like, the same way. All right. What about broadcast media, like TV or radio ads? Uh, we haven't really done a lot of broadcast media just mostly because we've gone from B to C to B to B. Right. So it's, it, it's just not the right venue to be doing a lot of that. Um, yeah. you know, it's just the, not the right, not the right product for us. Right. Um, I don't know how this next one would apply, but I'll ask anyway, what about like loyalty cards or physical discount coupons, any kind of tactics like that? Um, we, we've always not, we've never really had a problem with, uh, well, as, as far as the, as far as, uh, like loyalty, you know, we, we, I talked about that grandfathering our, our, our packages yeah. in. Um, and so I would say that's sort of like the ultimate loyalty uh, program where, you know, we hear we've developed this massive uh, new technology over the years. And we, you know, obviously some of that gets rolled into the product that he had bought, you know, a long time ago. And now you get to have all this because you were an early adopter. So I think that's any time that you can sort of uh, help your early adopters uh, and give back to what they did, because the, the value that they gave you in the beginning is just so much more than uh, a customer today as far as, you know, what they've developed for you and the feedback that they've given you over the years. So, right. um, yeah. And we, earlier you said you did a beta launch. Was that like free customers who were just paying for it in the form of giving feedback and testing things? We had a free version, yeah. So okay. we had a search bar that people could put on their their blog that, you know, basically you just type in your website and it would immediately go and produce uh, a, yeah. you know, a report for that, uh, score sheet, we called it. And so you could see a, a web page score sheet for whatever URL that you put in. Uh, and then, uh, that, that was a huge, you know, obviously that helped that helped those things help tremendously with building backlinks. Cause you could have, uh, an option to ha- have like a powered by and a lot of the, the bloggers would right. add that. So it would have a, you know, powered by our company and it would link back to our site. Um, so anytime that people, you know, put a free tool or, or mention a tool, maybe content writing is a good version today, or you write something really useful and people link to it uh, right. or cite it. Um, so anytime that you can do something like that, uh, is obviously a huge signal for Google as far as authority and trustworthiness for, for a brand. So that brings us right into the digital marketing side of things. Um, you've got your own website and are you consistently putting out your own blog content and using your website as like a lead gen source? Yeah, we just started doing that again. I mean, one of the things we've gone through different eras where um, we, you know, in the B2C era, we were very into that. Uh, obviously, you know, wanted to be ranked number one for uh, website grader or SEO software or whatever it was that we were trying to sell. Uh, and then when we kind of moved away doing B2B, we found that most of our conversions really were, wasn't coming from organic. It was actually coming from just direct sales, right? Like actually going directly to these companies or referrals. Uh, it was just a, a sort of a different conversion funnel or sales funnel. And 
Uh, and then, so now, obviously now what we're doing is kind of slowly going back to that. Cause we're, we're starting to realize like uh, a lot of, a lot of our potential clients could be agencies because agencies mm-hmm. we're, we're essentially giving a tool for agencies to make a lot of money. And so they like us now because we're sort of like a, uh, a technology that can en- enhance their sales. And so uh, we want to be a little bit more focused on content. So we're starting to build out a, a, a sort of like a FAQ section of, of content that uh, is sort of around our domain uh, acknowledge, right? So everything that is about search engines and search engine models and everything that we know about this, um, we, we try to publish uh, content to do that. So, yeah. And it seems like SEO in general, like as an industry has gone more mainstream over the past decade or two, just because as the world digitizes yeah. all the businesses more and more realize, oh, we want to be found for our services. Yeah, I think I think we haven't seen it the the huge wave yet. I think really, uh, I think well, no. So because I think uh, when COVID hit, uh, I think yeah. when you saw a massive transformation of the the uh, digital marketplace, right? A lot of people are now going online. Everything's online uh, from that. The problem with that is is uh, that that our economy has been sort of in a a, a, a very situ- well, fragile situation. Uh, there's been a lot of inflation. We're probably going to get enter into sort of a mini recession here in 2023. A lot of people think um, so. You uh, you have a lot of businesses that uh, may have lots of cash, but are are a little bit worrisome of like what to do. Like they're all just kind of sitting there waiting to see like, what should we do. Make sure that the bottom doesn't fall out because we don't know like how far of a recession this is going to be. Type of thing. So yeah. I think you've got this big. Uh, powder keg that's been built up uh, where everybody is moving online and everybody and their brother wants to to rank on Google because that's the primary, you know, that is, is sort of the, still the primary driver of, of uh, visitors to their site and their business now. And there's the scale of that is I don't think people understand the scale of it. Um, just how many, how many people are now, you know, talking about having a website or having a social media account uh, you know, this has really just pushed everything online, uh, but the the uh, the economy hasn't really uh, converted that yet. I think. Hmm. Uh, I think what we'll see in the next a year or two is as as we come out of this recession and a, a lot of the investment starts to occur, uh, you'll see just just instead of just coming back to what we were pre COVID, I think you'll see like a five x or a ten x uh, just a wave of of uh, spending dollars into all areas of digital marketing. Wow. I like to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, social media marketing. Are you guys using Facebook? We don't use Facebook. Uh, okay. this again goes back to sort of like the, we've been focusing Market. on just kind of, the the b2b thing although now mm-hmm. we're trying to be a little bit more uh uh pushing it. It, it i think facebook and um uh you know uh uh facebook and some of these other like tiktok these are yeah. very good b2c channels uh right. you're seeing this across the board with any kind of small consumer item they're great for uh getting influencers to to promote uh, a lot of these products instagram uh, so all of these are great channels to do this on. Um, if you're doing B2B, it's more LinkedIn and Twitter as what we're finding is, is really kind of the, okay. the, the way the audience that you're, that you're focusing on. So we, we are mostly focused on LinkedIn and Twitter right now. Uh, we'll have a, an official market brew, uh, Twitter account for instance. And, and then, um, uh, I try to personally promote uh, market brew, like, you know, and, and just to have a more personal, uh, uh, account that's, that's talking yeah. a little about the areas of search engines, right? So we, I talk a lot about machine learning and artificial intelligence and all the things that kind of go from a search engineer's perspective, not necessarily like an SEO yeah. agency or SEO company. Um, and yeah, so we do that on both Twitter and LinkedIn. All right. Do you use YouTube or TikTok or other video focused apps? Yeah, so we, we actually find that uh, videos can be pretty transformative for your business in the sales funnel. Uh, it really uh, scales very well. So you can you can have either case studies or public testimonials or uh, uh, how-to articles or, or videos. 
And all of these things uh, work very well for scaling up large audiences and, and uh, getting getting in front of a lot of people. So we have a Market Brew uh, YouTube account. Uh, we have you know uh, anywhere anything from like you know promotional videos of new features in the in the product to me giving speeches in Napa in front of all the industry leaders. Uh, you know it it really just depends on like the the uh, the type of video that that we're producing, but all of that kind of be. Uh, kind of be you know, located on, on uh, the YouTube account. And then you could obviously embed this in different pages and different locations where, right. where it needs to be. But yeah. So any of the other social media sites like Snapchat, Pinterest, like Telegram, all the kind of consumer focused ones you guys. We skip for now. Yeah. But yeah. those are all really good ones for if you're consumer mm -hmm. focused. Absolutely. Yeah. Those are all things that you can tap into. What about, uh, I think these kind of, crossover but like community focused or like discussion group type like reddit quora discord slack channels and stuff yeah i think i think those are more advanced like you have to have a, a a social media team that knows what they're doing you can't just wade into the uh those communities without like understanding how they work uh mm -hmm. because uh, one of one you know like reddit for instance uh that's an anonymous community and so you can just yeah. have people sniping each other from even competitors, right? Competitors can yeah. create like a bot army of people that just come and make you look uh, silly. Uh, and and you, you have to understand like how that whole game is played before you even walk into that. Because I've seen lots of brands uh, try to promote on uh, like Reddit, for instance, and they, they do what they do on all these other channels thinking, oh, I'll just post my article and I'll say, hey, here I am. And then all of a sudden it, they just get destroyed. You know, Rand Fishkin is a good example of this. Like people hate Rand Fishkin really? on, on, on Reddit. Uh, they, you know, it's, I don't know what it is. Like they just, uh, yeah. it, I think it's a lot of the industry, uh, you know, thinking that he's too simplistic or, or he doesn't deserve the success that he got or something. I don't know, but uh, hmm. you, you see, a, you, you have these weird interactions and when people become anonymous, they don't, uh, you know, all, it's all, uh, all, the uh, no holds barred, right? Like right. The, 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 the niceties and the, the social uh, contracts that we have with each other go out the window. So you just have to, you have yeah. to be very careful uh, waiting into those. Uh, you make sure that you have a team that knows what they're doing. Cause you're in there with the trolls. On yeah. You're in there with the trolls. Yeah. <laughs> and Rand seems like such a nice, like polite person, like his persona, at least in this one, I've heard him talk on yeah. podcasts, or whatever. So He's not yeah. the only one. I mean, if you go on to Reddit, yeah. you can see like there are literally there's a lot of people that just get completely destroyed by uh, <laughs> just a, what appears to be like an army of people that just come in and, right. and all you know pile on. So like you have to sport. be, yeah, you, you got to go in all the way. Like you can't you can't yeah. just claim something and expect that no one's going to like challenge you on it, right? So you better have yeah. like all of your references, your citations your papers, everything that backs up what you're saying. You can't just go and say something because people will call you out on it and you need yeah. to, you know, and if, and if you're ready with all that information and you have all the, the details of what you're talking about, then that is a force multiplier, right? You actually will end up with a better marketing effect uh, right. if you have that. So you just have to, you have to do it correctly. It can be a very uh, good channel, but you it can also be, there's high risk. So it's high risk, high reward. It seems like Twitter's kind of lean in that way as well. That it always has been becoming more right. transparent. Yeah, yeah. I think with Twitter Blue, I think you're getting a little less, little, little more transparent, right? Like there's less anonymous uh, interactivity. The bots are kind of supposedly, if you're not Twitter Blue, you're getting pushed to the bottom of all the comments. Uh, so most people are just signing up for Twitter Blue, and they're you know you're getting real identities. Uh, interacting with each other. So it's uh, supposedly the idea is going to, it's going to be more civil. Um, I've noticed that. I don't know if you have, but I've, I've seen yeah. more civility on Twitter because of this. Um, so it's, you know, I think it's moving a little bit away from the, what Reddit is doing uh, or those types of uh, anonymous uh, marketing right. platforms. Real, this is a little off top, but it's, it's related to social media and SEO. Um, can you speak just a real quick about what's your opinion on the effect of it, like social media on SEO? Cause it seems like I've heard some debate about that in the past. It's like, Hey, it's external links, but it's, you know, it's on a social platform or whatever. Like, do you see that it has value like directly to, to somebody's rankings or is it just a little drop in the ocean or. Yeah. I mean, 
I, it, whether it's direct or indirect is, is it's unclear, obviously. Okay. Um, but you uh, you certainly can understand that uh, as a promotional platform, you know, you have people out there writing content and they're often citing Twitter and citing these conversations. A lot of the a lot of the studies that get cited in a lot of these papers or, or content articles are often you know first published on Twitter uh, oh, okay. as, as as a promotion uh, promotional like publication or something. So that's uh, clearly like a, a direct link to you know backlinks, right? So you you could get backlinks posting your articles on the social media platforms, uh, and then somebody says, hey, you know this is you know it references this this article because they saw it in one of their content articles. And now all of a sudden you've got backlinks coming from, uh, you know, a blog or something, an industry publication. So, um, that it's, it's a definite correlation between, uh, you know, posting on social media and having, uh, an uplift in organic. Okay. And would you say Twitter's the best tool for kind of that type of exposure where you're more easily quoted and that kind of thing, or, is it just the fact that you're just getting general brand awareness or just awareness on any platform could lead to more potential? It just depends on your, the, yeah, the, where your audience, where your customers are. Right. Okay. So that's, that's, that's the, the main idea is that you want to be on the place where your customers are, whether you want to be there or not. So that's a hint, hint for the SEO yeah. world. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cause you, I guess a lot of SEOs could start to think, well, as long as we rank for something, you know, they're just focused a hundred percent on the, the ranking side or the content and the Google's relationship with it. And there is that the human side of if people never find out about it, you're, you're missing out on all those potential organic links. Yeah. And I think we, people, people view, per, you know, promotion on Twitter is a little bit more organic than just po posting it on like a, uh, industry publication these days that everybody knows it's been paid for. Uh, yeah. you know, a lot of times it doesn't even say sponsored by, so it's, it's you, you, the, right. the savvy people really, they're looking for a little bit more organic, uh, the ability to like question you and have a conversation about it, not just like, you know, posting something and then saying, okay, now I'm done. So I, I think that's really where it's moving towards. And you see that it, like, it's really, that's why influencers are, uh, really at the top of that food chain now, uh, today in marketing is it's because people, uh, you know, most people believe that influencers are, you know, they trust the influencer. Right. And, and they, they still a large percentage of people don't think that they would ever like sell something to them, uh, <laughs> as a sponsor, even though that's how the whole industry works. It's still, it's like the new version of, you know, the Forbes article back in, uh, you know, five, 10, 10 years ago, where, you know, you have all these Forbes articles written and they're all paid for, but they all are written on certain under the guise of, of uh, these mass media outlets, uh, you see this still in a lot of the the mass media where you get articles published, and if you're not in the marketing industry, you, it's totally believable. You understand uh, what they're saying, and you you eat it all up. And but if you're in the marketing industry, you're like, oh, who paid for this article? Who funded that? You know, it's like everything you can just see exactly yeah. what's what's happening. So, uh, selling to marketers is one of the most uh, challenging. Uh, uh, it's like, you know, uh, uh, 11 out of 10 on the, on the challenge scale for, <laughs> for a sales team. And so, you know, it's taken a lot for us to realize like what we need to do to sell to marketers because you really can't be fake. You have to just be straightforward. You got to tell them exactly what, what the benefits of your product are and they have to, you know, be able to trust you and believe you. So that's, that's a very big yeah. component. That's just for this industry. So it's, it's it applies yeah. just for us, but yeah. Do you uh, use Google ads? Uh, we've done off and on Google ads there as far as organic versus PPC. Yeah. Uh, it's such a huge different difference in ROI. I mean, Google ads have gotten so expensive compared to right. uh, every, everything else. Uh, so if that's the only thing that you can do right off the bat, like if you don't have a backlink structure and you don't have a content team or something, then uh, Google ads is a quick, you know, kind of, at least get some people through the door and, and, and uh, know who you are. Um, but uh, so, you know, we've gone, we've gone every once in a while, we'll supplement it if we need to, if we need to promote like one specific thing very quickly, that's a okay. good way of using Google ads. Um, and, and obviously like it depends on the product that you're selling. So if it's, you know, for us, like uh, Google ads don't work as much for us because 
our entire industry knows that Google ads is just paid for. So it doesn't have any trust factor, right? Uh, right. So, uh, but for other industries, it might work just great because your consumer is not, you know, they go to Google and they see the search results. They don't know the difference between a sponsored ad and a, a organic link. So yeah, it doesn't, you know, imagine it just depends. SEO tools or SEO software is pretty high cost per click for a Google ad anyway. Yeah, I think it's like 80 or $90 per click or what? something. That's um, crazy. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and, and so it just depends on like your uh, your, your customer lifetime values. And you got to really know what you're doing as far as that. Yeah. Otherwise, you can just end up burning a lot of cash for uh, very little value. So um, you mentioned you weren't doing like organic content on Facebook. Do you run Facebook ads or Instagram ads? We don't do anything on Facebook or Instagram okay. uh, just because that's not where our audience is. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So Twitter and LinkedIn is where you focus. Do you do the advertising side of Twitter and LinkedIn? We haven't yet. Uh, we, we've, okay. we'll probably, we may, we may do this, uh, later in the year. Um, we have, I haven't really, you know, have, a, we haven't needed it yet, honestly. Um, but it just depends on the, the market conditions and everything. So we'll, we'll figure out, we'll figure out what we need to do, but, um, we probably run at least a few experiments on both just to see. I, yeah. I think we've run LinkedIn ads in the past and Twitter ads in the past, but this was like five, six, seven years ago. Um, and they just were never as, uh, uh, the, the best ROI we've ever gotten was just uh, writing articles in industry publications. Uh, you know, we've been featured in like TechCrunch and we've been featured in um, uh, all the like industry journals not as sponsored articles, but just referenced in their, in, in expert articles, like search engine um, journal or search engine journal, uh, search engine land, uh, okay. search engine round table, I guess. I don't know. Like all, all yeah. everything that you can imagine. Cause we've been around for a while. Right. Um, I, one of the bigger ones was uh, TechCrunch. So having an article in TechCrunch was like a, a, a very big thing. We had a massive, yeah. we had like 10,000 viewers, uh, in like the first hour or something like that. Wow. Or that, um, so yeah, so it was it you know we for us the 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 biggest conversion is is uh, just where you can find trust right so it's not you're not trying to directly sell to people uh, and and that's hard to do to the marketing industry because everybody knows when you're selling and everybody knows like what you know uh, sort of what you're trying to do so it's um, you know it's even if you don't want to be salesy and you're just trying to promote like a new feature or something like that. It's, it's still hard to not wade into those waters of, of promoting. So it's um, right. the, the biggest thing is really uh, you want to just any, any article, if you're trying to promote yourself, just, you know, 80% of the article really should be about not promoting you. Um, hmm. It should be helping the, helping the, the reader uh, with their problem. And then obviously the, the other 20%, you can, you can say, uh, what, what products or features that you have that can augment that pro, you know, that solution to their problem. So that rolls right into what I was going to ask next. And that is SEO as a search engineer and co-founder of market brew. Are you guys using your tool market brew itself and other SEO tactics to, you know, as part of your own market? Yes. <laughs> yes. So we've done a number of sites, which all are, I'm going to remain private about, but Okay. You know, we've, we absolutely. I mean, you can imagine we have this tool that can literally—it's a cheat code for Google. So, yeah. um, you know, it's—it's it's, we're we're almost 100% laser focused on uh, building our search engine, but we do have some side projects, and obviously, we we're using our our a lot of this new content that we're doing. We're running it through the model so that we're you know doing what we should be doing as far as what we'd advise all of our clients to be doing. So, yeah, um, yeah. One of the the biggest red flags is if you see a tech tech stack where they're not using their own tech stack. Right. right? So like, right. <laughs> yeah, they should be eating their own food. Um, yeah. and, and, uh, and if that's not happening, then it should be a big red flag. So the other thing is like, we, one of the easiest ways to, to improve your product is just to use it as a user. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's really sure. a no brainer. You, you want to, you want to constantly be using it for either your own stuff or helping somebody with their, their stuff and listening to the customer and product feedback. Um, that's a really crucial part of it. So for the market brew site itself, um, that's like the public facing market brew site. Are you guys still on the journey of getting to the the top of the rankings you want to rank for or like, how's that? Oh yeah. I mean, we just started again, like, uh, 
if you look at, uh, we, I mean, we literally just started publishing uh, content in November and we've been doing about, uh, I don't know, probably about two articles a day. Uh, so we've been, uh, every, every day we, uh, publish about two articles. Um, and we're trying to just, you know, uh, we use a combination of the AI generation and, and editor reviewing. So we just kind of use that to, to generate the, the, the content, the structure, and then mm -hmm. we have, and then we're constantly reviewing that and figuring out like, Hey, what do we need to add to this or what things are not correct? And we can take this out. So we'll, yeah. we, it's kind of like a, a kind of a hybrid uh, approach, yeah. just another tool, content writing tool. Um, so yeah, we just started, uh, I think we went from like barely a few keywords for the market brew site, the corporate site that we have, uh, to, we have over like a hundred keywords that we're ranking for now. Uh, just in the last month. Awesome. And it's like, I think we're 22% increase every, every week or something right now. So wow. <laughs> check back in about six months. I'm sure we'll, we'll be up there. <laughs> <laughs> and before that, you guys were just heads down, focused on the product, serving customers, like, and not really on growing. That yeah. We, organic site. wasn't a driver of us uh, for our, for our business. It really wasn't. Gotcha. Um, we were, um, you know, cause we, we were, we're essentially we're competing against like, uh, other SEO tools that are priced at like less than a hundred dollars a, a month. And this is like a mass market thing. And they're, they're going after like small accounts. And if you look at like a lot of the enterprise SEO companies, that most of their business isn't driven by organic. They're just, they're all done by, you know, uh, direct and, uh, referrals and stuff okay. like that. So, so that, so you guys still have like a sales team that's, or I guess now it's more the agencies or. Yeah, we're we're that... offloading all the sales to our agencies. So okay. if you're an agency out there and you want to use this tech stack and, and be a market brew reseller, uh, you can come to us. We will arm you with everything you need to know, and then we'll give you the sort of the playbook of how we sold into these large companies. So you can either do that or also take that and, and go down market and sell to your normal customers that you you know may be like a more of a mass market. Um, and so we're, we're just, we're laser focused right now on the, on the tech stack. So we are just, we're a bunch of search engineers. We're going to be focused on our search engine model and we don't have to worry too much about like the, uh, you know, like all the sales and, uh, uh, the, the entire sales funnel that we've kind of had to do for the last five years. We had to turn sort of turn into an STO agency to figure this all out and get it, get yeah. it, uh, running. And we did very well with that, but in order to scale, we, you know, we're, we're not interested in becoming a huge SEO agency. We want to just, uh, offload that and share that. So we're basically trading, you know, 50% of our profits. We, we give, uh, to the agencies, uh, as part of this reseller program. So it's a, it's an awesome deal for agencies. Uh, yeah. and so definitely go to the site marketbrew.ai. You can read a little bit more about it. And I think that's a perfect place to end it, man. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I think, that one little tagline you said earlier in passing is a good way to summarize market brew. It's like the search engine cheat code or the SEO cheat code for agencies. Um, so if anybody's interested, go check them out. Um, we've loved using it and it's been a, a huge improvement to our SEO efforts for our clients. But Scott, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Paris.